In this presentation, Dr. Noel Cockett, President of Utah State University, explains genetics and their role in the future of goat production. Dr. Cockett worked as a research geneticist for ARS for several years before becoming a professor at Utah State. The American Goat Federation, AGF, was organized as a non-profit national association in 2010 to represent the interests of all organizations and producers engaged in the production and marketing of goat milk, meat, fiber, pack goat, and grazing services across the United States. Uh, for those of you that have known my uh, research trajectory, most of my work is in sheep. Uh, I have some familiarity with uh, the goat genomics work because uh, sheep and goats are on a joint committee through USDA. Um, I also uh, want to point out that my talk is more futuristic uh, compared to the previous talk, which I found had uh, many, many practical take-home points. So think of mine uh, as something that those of you that uh, are using goat production systems we might be able to set up some different projects to apply this kind of genetic research to issues that you're facing uh, with the goat species. Um, I wanted to start off just briefly summarizing or uh, uh, getting you thinking about how the genetics of an animal um, come to be. The first thing uh, to remember with genetics is all animals and humans, mammals and humans, have two copies of every gene in their cells. The reason is that both the parents contribute equally to that genetic makeup. So uh, in order for the animals not to accumulate uh, multiple copies of every gene from generation to generation, the genetic uh, composition of an animal is halved during gametogenesis when the eggs and sperm are formed. So the cycle starts off with an egg and a sperm, each having one copy of every gene, coming together in fertilization creating an embryo that has two copies of every gene. The cells in that embryo then multiply, and each time the cells are multiplied, the DNA content is also multiplied, so that every cell of the adult animal has the same genetic composition as that egg and the sperm that were combined to create that original embryo. So the take home point is that our animals have two copies of every gene, equal contributions from both parents, and that that um, DNA or genes are reshuffled into the eggs and sperm of the next generation. Now the DNA, when it's copied in each cell, uh, that mechanism of copying the DNA actually uh, sometimes has mistakes or mutations. So the original cell will have three billion uh, DNA bases, DNA components, and when it's replicated or copied to form the new daughter cells, sometimes that mechanism isn't totally correct. Uh, this um, mutation rate or this mistake in the DNA happens very, very rarely, but as generations of cells and generations of animals are created, those mutations accumulate. So that at some point when you examine an animal within a species, you will find that that animal's DNA could have four to 25 mutations that actually could cause death of the animal if both copies of the gene were having those mistakes. Uh, we call that genetic load. How many deleterious mutations 
an animal carries. So the take home point of this slide is that DNA is copied or replicated with each cell uh, generation. It's not always accurate so that mistakes in the DNA or the mutations in the DNA are carried forward. Now, if one of those mutations actually finds itself into a sperm or an egg, then that could result in the formation of a new offspring and therefore have that genetic variation. If we didn't have this mutation occurring in the DNA, we would literally have every uh, single organism within a species being identical. So this ability to generate mutations, rather than being a problem, actually allows us to select for improvements from generation to generation. We're just hoping that those mutations are something favorable rather than deleterious, which would cause death. So as I was thinking about genetic variation, there's lots of ways you can think about this. The mutations that occur in the DNA that are passed on to each generation of cells, but also the mutations that find their way into the sperm or the egg. So when that very specific egg is combined with that very specific sperm, you're creating that unique individual or that unique embryo. This then is what allows us to have the ability to genetic select across our parents for the next generation. And I think of that as one of the ways we can capture or harness that genetic variation that exists among our animals. Now, um, uh, up until about the 70s, there really wasn't any way for us to know what those genetic variations or those mutations were within the DNA. But as time's gone along, we've actually developed different methods for detecting those mutations right down at the DNA level. And it turns out that we can do this uh, through a process of detecting SNPs. And this is just the variation that exists between one DNA strand to another. And so on this slide, you're seeing that uh, the DNA strand would have this order, so the G A's, G's, C's, and T's, but there's been a mutation right in this T. So the other uh, DNA strand, instead of having a T, now has a C. And again, if this was passed into the sperm or the egg, it could actually cause a difference in the resulting offspring. We now have the mechanism or the ability to detect these SNPs all across the genome. Uh, they're very, very frequent, abundant, and we can do this uh, in a single uh, SNP test. And that's something that uh, the people that work on genomics have really been talking a lot about uh, two different producer groups because we can look for these SNPs all across the genome and then separate or characterize our animals based on which genetic difference they have. So I'm actually going to do a few slides on how we can use this uh, detection of genetic variation, this detection of SNPs, and how we could actually sort animals based on their DNA differences. So the example that I'm using here is a little bit uh, simple. It's whether uh, or not we can detect the genetics of an animal, whether they have horns or polled. And then we use this information to actually look at the DNA region and determine what is causing that difference of horns and polled. So to start out on this kind of experiment, we would actually just register or record the animal's physical appearance or phenotype. In this case, whether the animals have horns or are polled. We then run the SNP test, which could be as many as 50,000 SNPs or maybe even 600,000, or sometimes in humans, they actually look at a million SNPs and see if any of those 
combinations of the two DNA strands can predict what's happening at the phenotype. So for this example, I'm just showing what would happen at three different mutations. Again, every gene or every SNP has two copies, one received from its male parent, one received for the female parent. For SNP1, animals one through four received Cs from both parents, so they're homozygous. The fifth animal, though, for SNP1, received a T from one of the parents and a C from the other. But you can see that there's no prediction uh, using SNP1 on whether or not an animal has horns or pulled. SNP2 is a completely different location in the DNA. You could have either an A or a G, and then the five animals have different combinations of that A and G, depending upon what they receive from the parent. If you look at SNP3, though, that appears, wherever that is in the genome, that appears to predict whether or not the animals have horns and pulled. So the three animals with horns have received C's from both parents. The two polled have received two T's from both parents. Now this would look like it's a great predictor for whether or not the animal has horns or pulled. But we wouldn't just stop with five animals. In fact, to be really uh, confident that this SNP predicts this single gene trait, we would want to do probably 30 or 40 animals. I've now shown you what happens, though, when you continue to record animals for horned and pulled and then test this SNP3. It's all going according to plan until you hit the 12th animal. And now you see that it's not still the AAs that it was predicting it. It's actually a, an A and a C. Now, what's probably happened is that this SNP is not causing an animal to be horned or pulled, but it's in the DNA region that's closely linked to that horned and pulled gene. So we would continue to, um, to uh, test the SNP in more and more animals until we are confident it either is a good predictor or it's not. And the closer that it is in the DNA molecule, the more likely it is to predict uh, horns and pulled or phenotype. Um, so we're, we're doing this now in a large number of traits um, with a large number of SNPs. And I'd now like to show you a few results where we have actually used this type of testing to not only find a SNP that predicts uh, the animal's phenotype, but also tips us on what the gene is that's actually causing the phenotype. So uh, the example that I'm going to show here uh, is a project that we've done at Utah State, and it's actually looking at horns in Navajo churros and Jacobs. Uh, these animals, many of the animals within the breeds are four-horned, and we had requests uh, if we could identify the genetic cause of this uh, horn phenotype. So uh, for about $150 per animal, we actually had uh, 10 polled animals and 81 horned animals tested for 50,000 SNPs. This would be what the result looks like from that test. To orientate yourself, each one of these little dots is one of those SNP results. And it's saying, does that SNP predict whether an animal's pulled or horned? The better it is in the prediction of these 91 animals, the higher it is up the significance axis. So in this particular SNP looks like a really good predictor of whether or not uh, the animals are pulled or a horned. Uh, the different colors are just chromosomes. This is how the DNA is broken up into cells. But as a researcher, I would be particularly interested in this area right here. 
Uh, it's the bright pink, which is chromosome 10. And I've got a lot of SNPs that are saying uh, they do a great job of predicting whether the animal is polled or horned. And so there it is, highlighting that particular uh, region of the genome. Now we've also done uh, sequencing of the ovine genome, all the DNA uh, units of the animal. And it turns out that right in that region where those SNPs are is a gene called RXFP2. This is something that has been shown to be actually causing an animal to be polled or horned. Uh, so in this particular study, with just using 10 horned and 81 polled, we could have detected the gene that actually causes that. Uh, this was already shown, though, in some other research projects, and it wasn't the real reason why I uh, chose to sample Navajo uh, Churros and Jacobs. What they were interested in is could we predict uh, whether the animal, uh, based on a DNA test, would be four-horned or not. Um, so we then uh, arranged the animals. We got rid of all the polled animals in our analysis, and we just compared two-horned versus four-horned animals. And again, using that same SNP data, we said, is there any region of the genome along these chromosomes that helps us predict uh, that particular phenotype? And lo and behold, we found a region uh, here in the blue where the SNPs line up really, really well because they're very, very good at predicting that phenotype. And we look, it's on chromosome two. This uh, analysis, we needed, we used 32 horned and 51 uh, four horned. So again, it's not a large number of animals on these single gene traits that you can use to genotype and then identify these different uh, mutations. Now, what we did was actually went back again to look where those SNPs were in the sheep genome. And it turns out that the region contains something called Hox genes. These are genes that are, are turned on and produce proteins very, very early in embryogenesis, when the embryo is actually deciding whether this region's gonna be an arm or this region's gonna develop into a leg, this region's going to turn into the head. It's actually a little bit surprising that something so early in embryo development would actually be determining whether an animal's two-horned or four-horned. But uh, the region that these SNPs are, these mutations are, is in the Hox 1 to 3 genes. And lo and behold, those are the ones that actually develop the head and the skull of the animal. Now, um, this is uh, this was an exciting result, but it turned out that other people have also been collecting four-horned breeds of both sheep and goats and looking at where those SNPs are for those different breeds and species. All of those uh, breeds and both uh, and also in goats are all mapping to this hawks region. Now in the goats, it turns out it's not quite the same mutation as in sheep. It's actually a deletion of DNA where those animals are actually missing part of their DNA right in that region. And we've never been able to find then a homozygous goat, a goat that has a deletion from its mother and a deletion from its father that actually is uh, out there. So what's happened is that deletion, if it's just passed on from one parent, you can end up with four horns. But if you have the DNA with the deletion passed on from both parents, it actually causes death of the embryo because these Hox genes are very, very important for proper formation of the head and the skull. So if you had, uh, 
uh, embryos that you wanted to determine whether or not they were going to be four-horned or two-horned, you could actually test these SNPs, determine which way you were, your embryo was going to go, and, uh, and actually determine whether they'd be four-horned or two-horned. The reason I'm smiling a little is I'm not sure that's really of practical use to you because you can literally have the the goat or the sheep born and then tell whether or not it has two or four horns. But it does give you an idea of how these genetic marker tests could be used. The one though that I think will be of interest to you is what we're doing with entropian in sheep. This, as you heard from our previous speaker, is where the eyelid of the lamb or the, the baby goat is turned under at birth. And it irritates the eye with those eyelashes uh, uh, scratching the cornea. Now at USU, when we find these animals, uh, we'll just unroll the eyelid and uh, surgically staple the eyelid open. And then after about two weeks, the staples popped out and the eyelid uh, remains turned out. Now, I had heard about entropian in sheep uh, for several years, and to me it just seemed like something that just happened with the lamb, maybe the way it was laying in utero. I really found it hard to think that this could be a genetic uh, mutation. But it turned out that in uh, a few years ago, we purchased the first three rams that are shown on this slide uh, right here. And uh, uh, I'll keep the, the source of the flock uh, uh, anonymous, but we then mated these three rams to either our teaching flock, something that Lyle McNeil keeps at USU, or to other ewes that were purchased from this flock. And our uh, sheep manager was quite alarmed at the high frequency of entropion that was in these lambs. Uh, we had literally never seen this, this high frequency. So uh, that started me thinking that we maybe did have a genetic cause for entropion. So we saved back some of the entropion rams, those that actually had entropion at birth, and then we mated them to other animals. Uh, the calipige flock, um, I've talked about calipige at other meetings. This is a flock we've had for many years, and we've always culled lambs out of there that had entropion. So when we bred uh, an actual ram that had entropion, as a, as a lamb, back to use of this flock, we had very, very low incidence of entropion. But when we uh, mated it to use that they themselves had entropion at birth, we uh, realized much higher levels. So um, this provided a really exciting flock to be able to test those SNPs on and see if we can now identify what gene might be causing this. So we did the same thing where we tested all the animals that were in this flock with those SNPs. And here's the result from it uh, where each of these different colors is uh, the chromosomes and where that circle is what the significance of that SNP is in predicting entropian and non-entropian lambs. Now this one is not as clean as what it showed with the four horns and two horns because this is probably not just a single gene trait. Um, that also comes out when you look at the matings and the production of entropian in our, our flock. But there was something right here on chromosome three that when we spread out that region, we just got rid, we stretched from here to here. Now we can see more of that region highlighted and you start seeing uh, SNPs that are lining up with significance. So then we went back to that region in the genome to see what genes are there. And I'm not gonna say that this is proven yet, but what was really interesting to us is there are collagen genes in this genetic region on chromosome three. Now collagen is a well-known pro protein that's involved in the structure of skin, bone, heart. 
uh, it creates a protein that then uh, intertwines into the fiber. So it's giving strength to uh, the skin or the bone or, or the heart. Now, um, I'm not, like I said, we haven't proven that this is, but I did, when I saw that it was a collagen, I reflected that uh, women such as myself of advancing age, uh, there's a lot of advertising of uh, different kind of face creams that you can apply around your eyes uh, to avoid wrinkling. And they're collagenase or collagen, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is something to do with collagen on the, I guess you could say the strength of the skin around the eye. And I'm speculating that in the entropian animals, there may be a mutation in the collagen gene that's affecting the strength of the skin therefore allowing the eyelid to roll in. Uh, Stephen uh, White, um, who's one of the speakers later um, in today's program, is also working on entropian in sheep, and we hope that by combining samples and combining analyses, we can actually pinpoint more uh, closely into this. And if we could, we would then have a genetic marker that would be of use to people. They could actually test uh, lambs or baby goats at birth to predict whether or not they carry the defect uh, in, their, in their DNA and then decide whether to cull those or not. And I'm very appreciative to Tom Boyer, who is collecting um, some different samples for us to use in this project. Another way that the SNPs can be used are for disease traits. I just wanted to give you an example of this um, that on some work that's done on ovine persistent pneumonia in sheep, OPP. Uh, this was done by Mike Heaton at US Mark in Clay Center, Nebraska. Now he did a sort of similar thing uh, as we did with four-horned and two-horned, or entropian and non-entropian. He picked OPP positives and OPP negatives, or controls, and then ran the SNP chip across the DNA of those animals to see if he could identify SNPs that predicted whether or not an animal would get OPP or not. He found one of those peaks on chromosome 17. There's a gene there called TMEM154 that looks like it's a protein that allows the virus causing OPP to enter the cell. The mutation uh, is, is affecting how easily the cell allows OPP to enter and infect uh, the cell and therefore the animal. Now 2.75, a risk factor, isn't a magic bullet. It will just tell you that an animal with a certain combination of, of DNA is 2.75 times more likely to get OPP than an animal that doesn't have it. The other thing about this uh, particular genetic marker is if this animal is exposed to lots and lots and lots of OPP in a highly infected animal, even if it has two copies of this more resistant allele, the animal will come down with OPP. So again, we haven't found the total magic bullet or silver bullet for eliminating OPP, but it can be used as a management tool. Now again, I've been showing uh, very simple traits, things that have been controlled by a single gene to some traits where there's multiple genes. And now I wanna move into a trait where there's lots of genes and the environment affecting it. And that's parasite resistance. I've worked on this uh, in sheep for several years. And even though we've genotyped 414 animals with uh, the the SNPs, the 50,000 SNPs, we uh, still have not pinpointed the specific regions. And the reason is that when I looked at across the genome, there were 144 different regions 
that came up positive for predicting whether or not an animal was parasite resistant or parasite uh, uh, susceptible. So there's lots more work to be done on these quantitative traits in order to actually have a SNP that can test, can be used to test. But what we're seeing uh, now, um, it's been around for in cattle for several years, cattle, pigs, chickens, and we're actually talking on doing this project in sheep and possibly someday in goats, is doing something that's cheaper. Uh, it's a low density SNP chip where every one of those SNPs has been previously associated with a trait. Uh, this would give a, a test that would be in the $35 range, but it might have all the SNPs that are involved with traits like entropian, uh, disease traits like OPP, and maybe even other phenotype traits of interest to producers. Uh, the animals could be screened for these different SNPs and then through uh, genetic selection software, you could actually have different weighting factors um, depending upon which traits you wanted to emphasize and what the animal SNP test turned out to be. Um, now, again, in cattle, they're using this SNP chip, this low density SNP chip, to actually sort animals in feedlot. And this is helping them predict, you know, how they'll grade and when they'll finish. But to get there, uh, it, was, uh, it was probably about a couple million dollars to identify which SNPs those would be. So I'm hoping that uh, through these different ideas, and certainly with our last speaker, the last slide, maybe some different projects that you'd be interested in testing for the association of SNPs. Um, so I hope that uh, in the near future, we can actually get some of these genetic marker tests out there for you to use. The next part that I would like to talk about, which I'm going to lean over here and see what time it is. Let's see. Okay. 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 Is um, we can actually now create genetic variation. Rather than waiting for the DNA to mutate and be passed on to an offspring, we now can actually alter the DNA of in animals um, through uh, uh, genetic editing. Now, I know many of you, I am thinking all of you, have heard about the concerns with GMOs. This is something that many people are concerned about consuming uh, and even having out on the market. Now, this was using the old technology, which was transgenics. And I've got a, I, I just want to say that that uh, actually left behind in each of the animals that were created, animals or plants, a residual from the bacteria or virus that was used to transfer that, that gene. But there's actually a new technology something that's called CRISPR that simply goes in and mutates the DNA as if it's that DNA is replicating within the cell. So we now have the ability to actually alter the DNA just as if nature did the mutation itself. I want to point out something about these two pictures. The one of the fish are actually genetically edited fish that fluoresce under a fluorescent light. Um, they're totally normal fish, other than they have this fluorescent, uh, fluorescent gene uh, in their DNA, sort of like what's been used in fireflies or some of the other kinds of bugs that uh, fluoresce. The reason that I stuck on that other picture is when you go out and you see what public think about GMOs, that bull, which is actually a Belgian blue, is often used as the poster child for what is wrong with GMOs. But for those of you in the beef cattle industry, you know that a Belgian blue is simply a natural mutation in the myostatin gene. We did not create Belgian blues. Uh, it's something that happened naturally that causes that very, very heavily uh, muscled animal. So. I myself, I will tell you, I do not have any issues with GMOs. 
um, even if it did leave that that uh, residual DNA behind. And I'm certainly very, very comfortable with genetic editing using this new method. And I'll just tell you, the way I answer it when uh, my kids ask me, if I was concerned about ingesting DNA, I probably shouldn't eat strawberries, oranges, beef, uh, asparagus, because somehow I would be consuming that DNA. Um, so the DNA of any cell that's ingested by you is broken down. It's not possible for it to go in and actually mutate your own DNA. So that's why, you know, I'm a big advocate for genetic editing. And I'm going to show you there's actually uh, real live examples of this using this new method called CRISPR. So in a very, very brief way, it simply cuts the DNA like it does when the DNA is multiplied, and then using uh, some uh, primers that actually have the new DNA sequence lining around it, the DNA, the cell's uh, mechanisms, just repair that DNA as if it had mutated itself. And so again, you can't tell that DNA from something else that's just been mutated uh, by nature. So like I said, we've actually got real examples of this uh, occurring. One of the ones that's most exciting to us that use uh, genomics and livestock is this one. Um, it actually, the, the polled horned uh, gene in beef cattle, that mutation is very well known. It's been sequenced in a lot of different breeds, Charlais, Angus, uh, Herefords. But in the Holstein, very few animals have that particular mutation. And so it leads to a welfare issue when you have to dehorn uh, the, the, the dairy animals. So Recombinetics, which um, is a USA-based company, mutated the DNA of a Holstein uh, to have that mutation. That's now been passed on to different clones. Uh, these are two of the resulting animals, Holsteins without horns, and here they are at about nine months of age. Again, would relieve or reduce the need for dehorning in this line of Holsteins. Two other uh, genetic edited examples that exist, one was done in the UK and one was done in China. The first one gives some mutations that uh, result in a line of domestic pigs that are resistant to African swine feeder. The one down at the bottom is actually something that China did where they mutated two different genes. One that causes the goats to have cashmere and the other one is the gene that caused heavy muscling in the Belgian blues. So this line of goats carries now those two uh, DNA mutations resulting in the animal shown on that slide. Uh, well, to not be left behind, USU has also produced some of these genetic um, edited animals. And uh, years for years, I worked on a trait in sheep called calipige that causes the animal to have more lean meat and less fat in the hindquarters of the animal. But uh, the sad story, sad part of the calipige story is the meat does have a tenderness issue. So U.S. sheep producers are not uh, very enamored with it. However, one time when I was bemoaning the fact that calipige meat was less tender, I hate to say tough, uh, a graduate student from Africa said, have you ever thought of exporting those calipige sheep to developing countries? And I, I never forgot his words. He said, because my people do not worry about tenderness of the meat. Well, to me, I always thought it would be a better production system to have calipige in goats for developing country. So we have genetically edited the DNA of goat to carry that mutation of calipige. We've created three uh, clones. They're shown right here. Here I am holding one of them. Uh, now, the weird thing about calipige 
is if it has two copies of the Calipige mutation, the animal's normal. These clones have two copies, so we can't tell whether the genes turned on or not. They actually need to be bred to normal female goats, and then in their offspring, we will check whether or not they're Calipige. Now, the problem with this is that FDA regulates genetically engineered animals as if they are a drug. This is disappointing because with a drug, you have to um, demonstrate that it does not affect the structure or any function of the body. Well, those demonstrating that a genetically edited animal is a safe drug uh, is a, a steep hill to climb, especially when you can't do taste panels or human consumption things to actually show that it's harmless. Um, so the only FDA approval of a of animal food product is currently in transgenic sample salmon. This was one that, that was created with the GMO approach where they actually left behind some of the bacterial DNA. But they took uh, the Chinook salmon growth hormone and the ocean poop promoter and inserted it in the Atlantic salmon. And the idea is the Chinook salmon growth hormone would make a bigger salmon and this ocean poot promoter would turn it on year round. And the end result is that these uh, Atlantic salmon, uh, these transgenic Atlantic salmon are much, much bigger than their normal uh, contemporaries. But it took 18 years and $70 million for FTA to be convinced that it was harmless. Um, now, plants are regulated by APHIS. APHIS does not require plants, genetically edited plants, to be tested as a drug. They actually are more worried about dispersion. Will these genetically altered plants cross with a native plant and then be uh, released into nature? They uh, also are more comfortable with genetic editing. Uh, so that even just recently, APHIS approved a white button mushroom that's been genetically edited so it doesn't brown. You can actually now buy this on the market uh, and it probably isn't labeled, just like soybeans, uh, corn, and wheat. Um, so again, my hope is that we can get FDA to move more like APHIS on the approval of genetically edited animals. The interesting thing, again, about these genetic edited animals is there's no way you can tell it uh, from a natural mutation. So let's just say that China uh, exports those cashmere slash myostatin uh, genetically edited goats that they've produced into the U.S., other than having those two mutations, we could not tell them from a naturally occurring uh, animal. I think FDA is probably going to move forward where they'll approve a genetically edited animal where you transfer one mutation from a breed into another, like the Holstein uh, pole bulls. I think it's going to be more tricky for FDA to approve an animal that's be created with a genetic edit that came from another species, like those calipige goats. So I just was, I've written down a few traits that possibly the goat industry would be interested in looking at. Myostatin to create these um, heavy muscled animals. You might also be interested in uh, genetic editing some of the genes that are related to reproductive rate. There are some uh, genes that are known to affect both the quantity and quality of milk. And then if we could identify some of these different disease res resistance traits, uh, people may be interested in genetically editing those. So the barrier is not the cost or the technology. Uh, creating that calipige coat 
we got a deal from Recombinetics, and it was actually about 20000 but we did spend a lot um, cloning and multiplying the animals that had that calipige mutation. But really, it's not onerous to do that. Um, so this is just one of the ones that I highlighted if, if uh, goat producers were interested in uh, increasing ovulation rate. Of course, the experiments would have to be uh, done to see you know, whether the animal is still functioning right, etc. But these two genes are the ones that are highly mutated in sheep breeds and giving us those high fecundity breeds uh, that are across the world. So the bottom line is, as you can tell, I think uh, genetic editing is definitely going to be on the horizon for our food animal production systems. And uh, I also want to encourage uh, the American Goat Federation to think about some different traits that they would be interested in having researchers look at for SNP markers. Um, so with that, I'll conclude and uh, see if there's any questions, if there's time. So, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, that would be fantastic. Okay. Okay. Yes, I'll give you my card. We need ETA purple top vacutainer tubes. We, um, for Tom, we looked into those oral swabs, uh, but yeah, I'd much rather have blood. It allows us to go back. And I think, you know, the story of the four horned sheep and goats having the same genetic region gives me hope that entropian may also turn out to be that same thing. And uh, having two different species in the same region really gives us confidence we're looking at the right genetic region. So yes, we would definitely like to have those. Yes? You know, when you talk about things like being able to uh, change the muscle or what they've done with the plants and stuff as we go along, that's kind of for some people not magic. Uh, it's also always been in the um, more or less the corporate structure, I guess. Where, where is that applicable to a private, private individual the person who actually wants to be involved in something like that? How would they become involved? You know, Recombinetics uh, is producing a lot of genetic animals, genetically edited animals um, for biomedical research. Again, at USU we have uh, both sheep and goats with mutations that are found in humans for egg fibrillation, cystic fibrosis, KRAS, cancer genes, etc. And once uh, the, the clones are produced, they become our, um, our property. So I can't, I think these genetic edited companies for a fee would create those and uh, then give up the rights uh, for those. Now, I can't imagine doing this, you know, maybe in uh, uh, just a goat production uh, system. So you might want to reach out to a research uh, institution or, or a university that's doing some of the genetic editing to make sure that they can get it going. Now, I will tell you, we're also, USU is also the one that has those goats that have the spider protein in their milk. And at this point, FDA is still regulating those. We have to have double fences. They can't breed with other goats, et cetera. So before I say in, a, in like, let's all do this, we really have to pressure FDA to change this uh, very, very strict regulation of them. So that, I think, is our first step, but I think it's coming. And earlier this year, the, the USDA has, well, now, hmm, we do have a different political <laughs> arena here. So, yes, that, I'm not quite as, yes, maybe I'm not quite as confident, but I think we could get that done. But, you know, the idea is, you know, if we had them ready um, once they're approved. I think Stephen White should also answer this project, 
or this question as well. Uh, but there are definitely uh, institutions, universities that are interested in this. Not to plug USU, but I'll tell you, we can do we do great uh, cloning and genetic editing in goats. Uh, not so well in sheep. Yeah, yeah. So you get one clone, one individual embryo, genetically edited. Then you multiply it through clones. Yeah. Yes, but once you, like those three male calipige goats, at this point, they can natural breed and pass it on. So, yes, yes, it's a combination, genetic editing, and then cloning it to multiply it. Um, we're making a distinction between GMOs and genetic editing. GMO, the definition of GMOs is the bacterial DNA or viral DNA is still present. The genetic editing, again, you cannot tell those animals from something that just appeared in nature. And I know I'm doing a little fear-mongering here, but I don't think China is necessarily going to worry about putting genetic edited livestock on the market. They are in it in a big way, a big way. So I think that's an important point. We should not refer to these animals as genetically modified organisms. We need to say that's the old way. We now have a new way. It's not using the animal's own, you know, DNA replication mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. The one good thing is FDA is, uh, is starting to see this as a very positive thing. And uh, we've got contacts with them. That's where I came up with this idea that they're probably going to approve the breed to breed first, and then the restrictions for species to species would be much higher. So, but it, it, you know, we need to speak out for this uh, because it really, the ones in chickens, they have avian uh, flu. They have resistant alleles from the wild fowl that they can now transfer into chickens. And why would you not want to do that? The American Goat Federation AGF is a nonprofit national association that represents the interests of more than 200 organizations and thousands of producers engaged in the sustainable production and marketing of goat milk, meat, fiber, and grazing services across the United States. This video was produced as part of the educational services of AGF. AGF also supports research projects that will benefit the goat industry by writing letters to accompany grant requests and providing information when requested. The Board of Directors is made up of representatives of member organizations, individual producers, and industry specialists from all parts of the United States. Director candidates are nominated and serve three-year terms on the board. AGF is headquartered in West Lafayette, Indiana, and open from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Visit our website, AmericanGoatFederation.org, where you will find information about goat management, health care, and other resources. While you're on the website, become a member of AGF and help us provide information to goat owners and represent all goat producers by providing information about our concerns and industry needs to government agencies, USDA, and researchers.